Hey, it's Mike. Welcome back to Intergalactic, a podcast about the greatest sci-fi movies and TV of all time, uh, except when it's not, like today. I was like, asterisk on greatest <laughs> today? <laughs> With me is Mariah Gossett. What is up, Mariah? Howdy, Mike. Excited to be here to talk about this beautiful entry into the world of cinema and sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> So good. So good. Um, listeners, if you showed up to the pod hoping for another Stargate review, uh, don't worry. Those are still happening. Our essential Stargate series uh, is still going on. But today we're introducing a new series called Inessential Sci-Fi. This is a sci-fi that you just don't have to watch or think about ever. It's essentially the uh, the garbage heap of the... Uh, syndicated sci-fi TV of the late 90s, early 2000s. And why are we covering this trash? Because we want to. <laughs> because it's my podcast and I can do whatever the hell I want to. And I kind of love this stuff. And with the uh, the invention of the wonderful, the most beautiful streaming app ever, Tubi. Oh, Tubi. You can watch all this crap, uh, even though what we're talking about now is somehow not on Tubi. Which is wild to me. This feels like a, t a classic Tubi establishment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if this thing were to get a reboot, it would be produced by Tubi. Oh, 100%. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's pull back the curtain. What we're talking about today on, on Inessential Sci-Fi is the first episode of Cleopatra 2525 Quest for Firepower. 500 years into the future. She will enter a world where machines rule the Earth. Mankind has been driven underground. And Cleopatra is about to discover there's no place like home. In the year 2525, there are women with the will to survive. Fight for a brand new day. Mariah, I just want to, every time, you know, we do a project together, I thank you for being here for obvious reasons. You are the, you're the host now of, of Star Trek Discovery Pod, doing a great mm -hmm. job with that. You're a okay. great podcaster and producer, a great pop culture critic. So I always thank you for helping me out. But today, I don't know how much more I can thank you for being on this show, <laughs> because this was probably one of the most ridiculous things I've ever had to make you watch. Cleopatra I mean, 2525, Quest for Firepower. You haven't told me how you feel about it yet. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm interested to dive into your feelings and emotions and thoughts about this insanity, but let me kind of orient us here. Yeah, get people prepared for what they're getting into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so this thing premiered January 17th, 20... Oh, I wrote 2020 for some reason. 2000, uh, 23 years ago, written by Rob Tappert, RJ Stewart, directed by Greg Yutanis who is now directing House of the Dragon episodes, so leveled up. Starring Gina Torres, the amazing Gina Torres from Firefly as Helen. Of course, on the show abbreviated to Hell, because why not? Why not? Victoria Pratt as Sarge, no relation to um, to Mr. Chris. Patrick Cake, Kaki, as Mauser, the mandroid. And of course, my favorite, Jennifer Skye as Cleo, the exotic dancer, who was impossibly placed in suspended animation after some complications with the breast enhancement surgery in the 20th century, who wakes up five centuries later to find that humanity has been driven underground, forced to wear midriff-bearing tactical gear, and battle a race of robots known as the Baileys. Mariah, did you know that this was executive produced by Sam Raimi? I mean, I did Google that, and I feel like you can tell from the vibes of the flips that it is <laughs> <executive> <laughs> produced by Sam Raimi. 
Very much. Yes. This is produced by Sam Raimi, also, who also produced at the time Xena Warrior Princess, mm -hmm. Hercules, the Kevin Sorbo Journeys. And this is created by the same team that made all of those shows. So after Xena and Hercules ended, in order to keep this production company going, Raimi and the team created a couple new shows, two half hour shows. One of them was Jack of All Trades with Bruce Campbell, mm -hmm. which was kind of a, a really fun, kind of goofy uh, steampunk uh, comedy. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that. I think I've only seen clips. I don't know if I've ever watched an entire episode. And it was paired with Cleopatra 2525. They called it the back-to-back -back action hour. Mm -hmm. And it was syndicated uh, throughout the world to to many people's delight in, uh, in the early 2000s. Um, Interesting thing, these two shows were the first American non-animated action series to be produced in the half-hour format since the 70s. Hmm. I thought we were going to go in for a full like 40-minute to an hour show here. I uh, cannot tell you how thankful I was when I saw a 26-minute mark. <laughs> and, it, you know, the whole first season, it's like 13, 14 episodes. They're all about half an hour, 26 minutes. In the second season, they canceled Jack of All Trades, so they needed to stretch it out to an hour. So they stretched out Cleopatra 2525 wow. to an hour. So I will not be covering season two of. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, Mike. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is a pretty wild show. Mariah, why don't you tell me? Uh, let's just jump into opinions. Why don't you tell me how you felt about this show? What'd you think about it? I mean, I could feel the shared DNA with Xena because I, I will admit I was a really big Xena Warrior Princess fan. Um, I don't know if you know the fun fact that um, Tig Notaro's first job in entertainment was working on Xena Warrior Princess. It's like one of my favorite weird Hollywood factoids to share. Um, what did she do on the show? I think she was a PA, like, <laughs> like very early job, went to New Zealand and worked on this show. Um, it also gave us Alex uh, Kurtzman. So it's like a lot of television yeah. that I now enjoy has spawned from this universe. Um, so I could feel some of that shared DNA, especially in the midriff bearing costume department. <laughs> you know, I feel like it, I, Sam Raimi really knows how to make television that intersects with two populations really well, which is um, queer women who don't know they're queer yet. And then um, horny teenage boys. Um, yes. And truly, that is what this show is made for. I I was, I will say, we we watched like a pretty not high quality rip. And I did wish I could watch it in a format, like maybe on a DVD or something just to get some of it. Because I was honestly a little impressed with the amount of visual effects that were applied into a half hour action TV show in the year 2000. I also was overjoyed to see Gina Torres because I think she's fantastic and was maybe one of the few grounding characters <laughs> in this entire thing. So she was really putting in the work on this script. Um, but the fact that this is like, a th there's lots of sexism to talk about within mm -hmm. this, but the fact that it's three women who are like kicking butt and it's a sci-fi series and they're the leads there's things I love and there's things I hate about it. You know, it's like, I love that these are the three people in charge of this show and they're leading the show. Do I love that they have to wear their boobs out in order to do that? And one of them, I mean, I don't know. One of them used to be an exotic dancer, but she's very clever. So I'm like, I'm here for Cleo. Mm -hmm. It also was a better surprise because in my mind, when he first sent me the title and I just read like, the log line in my mind, it was Cleopatra had been cryogenically frozen, like ah. the, like the historical Cleopatra, right? And then awoken, and I went, oh, this is at least much better because I was like, we're really still having. I mean, at this point, I was like, oh, we're still having white women play Cleopatra. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this isn't problematic at all, but um, but no, she's an exotic dancer who um is a mimic, which was a fun mm -hmm. uh, little character detail they threw in. So yeah, I, I overall had a good time watching it. The idea that they could stretch this um, plot past a half hour series seems a little improbable to me. Um, but I, I, I had a good time and there's things that I thought were fun and funny and it would be a good, it would be a great thing to put on having friends over to like have drinks and like put something silly on TV. 
Yeah, I'm I'm pretty bummed that it's not on Tubi or mm-hmm. available to rent somewhere that we had to watch this kind of 480p rip of it cuz there are some pretty fun like it's all action all the time. Yeah. And there are some really fun visual gags and and special effects like it's very lowest common denominator Raimi, but it's very Raimi in that way mm-hmm. that they do a lot with a little. Yeah. I had a blast with it. I think you talked about the outfits in the series. I feel the same as you. Like mm-hmm. these outfits were either clearly designed by cisgender men to tantalize horny teenagers in the early 2000s or by very cool, clever, sex positive motherfuckers I'd like to hang out with. Right. I'm not sure which like, is true. It, it balances that line mm-hmm. where you're just like, I don't know. I'd have to feel like what, what the actresses were feeling at the time. How mm-hmm. were those costume fittings, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I think that feeling of like, is this sexist, you know, schlock or is this uh, empowerment. Campy yeah. empowerment in on the joke stuff? Like, I think that can go for almost everything about this show. I kept asking myself, is this exploitation schlock or is it can't be clever satire? I think the answer is somewhere in the middle of those two like disparities, which actually is often the case with sci-fi trash of this era Mm -hmm. but i think this show embodies that duality more than any of them back in the day like it's trashy schlock but it revels in the fact that it's trashy schlock and it has a good time with it yeah i mean the other thing that was like refreshing is like you're watching you know it's like there's the scene where all of them walk into their like secret headquarter type thing that they're giving you in the in the pilot and they walk in and and Cleo's character is like ogling the like service robot they have and they're like oh he's not programmed for sex and you're just like oh this is like fun to see women getting to kind of be this sh- like schmoozy probably not okay you know like situation but you're also like but i guess if you're underground and this is your robot you can kind of like harass the robot question mark like (laughs) and reading the mythology of this series in preparation for this podcast which don't just don't do that um (laughs) it's revealed that the the mandroid is used to be an, an, an evil an evil oh. robot like the like the like the antagonist in this mm-hmm. episode but they reprogrammed him so yeah you can do whatever you want to him it's fine yeah. um one of the best things about these like Sam Raimi adjacent syndicated shows of this era is how the filmmakers try to copy Raimi's visual style and like but in like the most crude way possible it's like 90% dutch angles like so many unnecessary zooms so much like pre-matrix slow-mo but Mm -hmm. i found it kind of working for me in this especially like in this super fast-paced 30 minute format like it was so short and silly it just felt like it knew what it was and it was just like a candy delivery service right into my brain totally this the story is so stupid so simple so derivative it's barely even a story Mm -hmm. um this show clearly takes place in this underground post-apocalyptic world so that the production could save money filming in some dank ass warehouse with a bunch of green screens and the special effects like they are kind of impressive for the time that there's so many of them Mm -hmm. but like they're also like along with the costumes and the makeup very kind of spirit halloween you know (laughs) oh yeah i mean like the most practical effects is like in the opening sequence they're running through a big empty field and i was like oh i think they actually went and and actually did a couple of real like firework explosions behind these actors Mm, like it isn't just uh special effects like some of this is some real fireball happening and and that's fun Um, and then, yeah, like the creature that comes out of the sky, I thought was like, you know, like I was intrigued to learn about like more about these things that had taken over the earth's surface, you know, like I, I think if I had access to higher quality, uh, like I might be going online and looking for DVDs because I might actually watch all of season one. (laughs) I kind of want to watch it too. So this was your first like exposure to Cleopatra Mm -hmm. 2525, right? Yes. I remember seeing it, maybe catching a minute or two of it back in the day, just Mm -hmm. switching channels before we had, you know, streaming and everything. Um, I may have been living somewhere where we didn't have cable and this was on the public access or not the public access, but on like the syndicated 
whatever the channels that you could get with the rabbit ears and stuff. You exactly. Know? Yeah. yeah. Like Saturday at 4 PM, this was on, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm pretty sure I saw it because I, I really remember the image, um, the iconic image of Jennifer Sky as Cleo with her short girl haircut and all that, mm-hmm. um, the blonde pixie cut. Well, not necessarily pixie cut. What would you call it? Like a bob? Yeah, definitely a bob, bob situation. I think 10 minutes in to this episode, I found myself just super charmed and having so much fun with this dumb shit. I mean, I'm laughing at it and I'm watching it with like miles of ironic detachment, but I never hate watched it. Like I could probably, like you, I could probably yeah. binge this whole season on a sick day and have like a blast if given yeah, a chance. Yeah, like pour me a bowl of popcorn. I'm probably going to scroll my phone a little bit while it's on with like the overly extended action sequences that aren't good enough to really hold my attention for that long beyond a couple of fun flips over a camera. Um, but the but it was like, to your point, like the campiness of it for me was solidified one with the performance of Victoria Pratt, because when she Mm -hmm. is like pretending to shoot that alien out of the sky, she is pretending with all of her might and not in a way that I'm like, give her an Academy award in a way that I'm like, Oh, I would love to go have a drink with you. (laughs) Like You would be a fun person to hang out with. Like um, this cast is really going for it. Like the acting is like you said, it's not, it's not good. (laughs) It's not, it's not subtle, but it's some of it is pretty like self serious, but the performances have this great zest, you know, that I admire. Yeah, she's using her entire body to pretend shoot down these aliens out of the sky in her yoga pants. Um, the other thing for me that I really need to talk to you about is the creepy um, cat doctor and its snake assistant because oh oh my god my god the cat man and and he is I looked it up. His name is, he's billed as the cat man. Amazing. <laughs> is genuinely disturbing. Do we know who voiced cat man? Because he sounded so familiar. Yeah, I have it here. Cat man, cat man, cat man. Mark Williams. So I'm going to look this guy up because he was frightening. Yeah, and not just in the gross way that he looks, but also the implications of what he's going to do with a dormant body. Like, yeah, no, very come on, early 2000s sci-fi. That's not come on now. Very creepy. Um, I also found it fascinating that they were willing to trade a kidney for a little bit of wood when at first they were asking for things like not outdated weaponry or food or water or drugs, which all like those things all made sense to me. But then you know, you get Gina Torres pulling a photo out of some little wooden box and then giving away the wooden box. And so you're like, okay, this obviously has some personal connection, which is why we're made to believe that this is a value. But what is the value of wood in an underground society? <laughs> when they went to the surface and there is still trees, <laughs> yeah. like they, it might be harder to get them, but they do still exist. <laughs> Lot, lots of disparity or anachronisms in this show. Like, we had to live underground because the robots are above ground. And as soon as we pop our heads up, they'll come and they'll shoot us. However, we somehow also have technology that um, blo- jams your signal so they can find us. Yes. And, and then the other thing was it took them so long just staring at the giant robot thing for them to actually fire at it. And I was like, it feels like it would be more effective for you to wait or not wait, excuse me, it would be more effective if you did not wait for it to literally be right in front of you to defend yourselves. But I, I don't know if that was, it, it took so long for that, that robot to come and then for any action to start. <laughs> yeah. I think they were just maybe proud of the robot design. They wanted to show it off yeah, or just kill time. I don't know. And it took them like forever to turn on their shield against yeah. the robot. The whole time I'm like, turn on, you have a shield, turn it on. It's going to kill you. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking too much about this show. It's fine. Um, I want to talk about Gina Torres. Did you like Firefly? I did like Firefly. Yeah. I, I was a Firefly fan. Firefly fan. That's a hard yeah. thing to say. Um, uh, watched it in college. Um, had a great time with it. Um, it was, you know, I was one of those people who were like, it should get more seasons, you know, like when it mm-hmm. when it uh, came to its demise. But it had so many actors in it where I went on to to really enjoy seeing performances and other things. Um, and Gina Torres is definitely one of them. Yeah. She's proven to be a, a great actor. Firefly. She was part of the matrix, fa- part mm-hmm. of the matrix franchise. She was on Hannibal. She's done tons of stuff. She's a pro even here. 
in this early role. I feel like she commits and like you said, grounds her character as much as she can. And she seems to be having fun, but also trying to create a real character. She also sings the opening theme. That's incredible. Way to pull a Frasier. <laughs> <laughs> that was so surprising to me. It's like, was she really committed? Like that committed that she actually sings the theme of the show? I mean, if you like, if I was in her shoes and someone came to me and said, Hey, Mariah, I've got this like fun sci fi adventure TV show. It's going to have three female leads, and even your boss is going to be a voice of a woman. And in the 2000s, if you pitch that to me and you're like, oh, from the creator of the successful Xena warrior princess, you're like, oh, I get the vibe of what this is going to be. Like, it's going to be a little campy, but it's like Xena has some heart to it in the series. And there's lots of things that are still like pretty iconic pop culturally. So I could imagine if you're especially early career actress being like, great, sign me up, a syndicated TV show. <laughs> like, Fantastic. <laughs> Big time, yeah. And there's more to it. Apparently, uh, Gina Torres is part of a cast of a two-hour pilot. Before this, it's Sam Raimi produced as part of this whole oh. vibe. And the cast, it was a sci-fi show, and the cast was primarily black. And the network, or not the network, but the, yeah, the, the local networks wanted to pick it up, but only if the cast was primarily white. Mm. So Thanks, America. they changed the cast. They fired Gina and they had that show, whatever it was, and it only lasted a few episodes. But Sam Raimi was so bummed about it that he always wanted to give Gina Torres another shot. So he gave her, I think she actually played the actual Cleopatra on Xena and Hercules. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. And then he, he gave her this role in this show. So that was him saying, you know, trying to make it up to her by casting her in these things. Um, you talked about Victoria Pratt as Sarge. She doesn't necessarily have the presence of Gina Torres, but she's fucking solid. She's fun. And she knows she's fun, Matt. She knows what kind of show she's in. She lands the tone really well. Um, she does this great, like tough girl vamping. She knows what she's doing and she's been in a whole bunch of sci-fi stuff too. So I think she's one of my new favorites in this kind of like sci-fi trash genre. Yeah. And then give me your, Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say Jennifer Sky. What a great scream queen. Like I, yes. I was like, I hope she goes. I was like, I need to look at her. Cause I was like, she's truly doing a disservice if she didn't go into horror. And it looks like she might not have like done too, too much past the early two thousands. She didn't do much after this. I know she was a model and she also was in Xena. Oh, she was in Xena too. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of love her. And it's not just because she's wearing like Lilu's skimpy costume. For the fifth element. It was very Lulu inspired, yes. <laughs> Throughout this entire episode. But she's like legit funny. Even when she mm -hmm. overdoes it, I find it super charming. Um, she is a great scream queen, although I could do with her screaming less towards the end of the episode. She's like yeah. constantly screaming. But it's it's genuinely funny. Like when this show decides they're going to have her quote pop culture shit, like Dirty Harry and the Three Musketeers. And everybody looks at her like she's this profound philosopher who's giving this <laughs> great poetic context to their lives and struggles. I think I, I read that that's an ongoing theme of the show, which is great. I do love that. I mean, it, it makes sense because like it, to be a 20th century exotic dancer, you've got to have your wits about you. And so <laughs> the way that she's like, Oh, I'm 008. I'm a secret, you know, like she knows how to play the game to be like, I have to survive. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I thought she was great. I thought she was very funny, um, gave some good like levity. And so I don't mind the absolutely horrendous origin story they've given her, like, instead of just like, oh, she's someone who is cryogenically frozen. I don't need to know it was after a botched boob job, you know, <laughs> like I am, it was very funny to see her wake up and it, immediately look at her boobs and be like, did they do it? <laughs> like <laughs> Oh, good job. Okay. Like it happened. <laughs> Why would they cryogenically freeze her if the boo job worked? Why would they? Okay. I'm well, asking they too many questions. It was like, they said it had to do with the anesthesia. Like she had a reaction to the anesthesia and wouldn't wake up. So they cryogenically froze her until they could come up with a solution because we obviously have cryogenically freezing capabilities in the 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, if I go in for a root canal tomorrow and it, something happens, I can easily wake up five centuries in the future and everything will be fine. Absolutely fine. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So tell me about, you You mentioned, even though we had fun with this and there's obviously some smart campy shit going on mm-hmm. in the writer's room, some sat- satirical shit going on, and these actors really know what kind of show they're in and they're having a blast leaning into the camp. You said, and I kind of agree with you, you said there was some sexism to talk about here. Yeah. I mean, I'm always thinking about like, is it, is the sexism or like raunchy humor act one actually funny? And then two, does the, does the humor uh, elevate or deflate the show for me? And Mm. so like, I mean, I'm a big fan of like John Waters and like, you know, Pink Flamingo really toes the line for me, but I think that's the point of the movie, you know, like, and so to me, it's also about intention. So I'm like, oh, is this skimpy outfits, the commentary about skimpy outfits and sci-fi things, or is it just like, we know this is what's going to help us sell this show. You know what I mean? It's like, it's more about where is the intention. And because I am a big fan of Xena and I felt like they played some of that, I have, I hope that it was a good experience. And I know a lot of people who really enjoyed working on these shows. So to me, that's always a good sign as well as like most people have said, like working on Xena for them was like a genuinely positive experience. Um, so I don't know what it was for this particular show. I just know the lore of Xena and a lot of, especially a lot of women um, and younger writers who got their start there and kind of learned how to not run an abusive television show. Right. Um yeah, this show is essentially the continuation of that. You have all right. the same behind the scenes people working on this show. Yeah, it's shot in New Zealand. It's like, yeah, it's like all the same production house. So I would assume it's pretty similar. You know, I think it would take more than one episode for me to like fully um feel it out, but to me seeing a show where they're actively like, oh, if the way we get three women as the core cast of this show is to we have to put them in a little bit of skimpy outfits for the execs to let this be grinning lit then like yeah i mean it's it's literally the year 2000 things were much much different you know yeah um and even still like are they the skimpiest outfits i've ever seen on a tv show no (laughs) so at least like one of them's in pants and it's even commented on yeah, the fact that they make jokes of like, oh, your midriff like armor is really doing you a favor, you know, like what I love about this is that it's not mean spirited. It's not mean like Cleo, sure, she's she plays the character is a bit of an airhead, but But she's actually kind of smart. She's very smart. She comes off as an airhead at first, but she's actually very smart and very intentional and has skills that help them defeat the big bad at the end, right? So the show isn't mean-spirited towards this character. The show is actually celebrating who she is, and it's celebrating who all these all these female characters are. Yeah. I think I think that's great. And I and I have to, you know, it's like there's the tongue in cheek. I mean, the fact that they call like humanity has moved underground and the elaborate shafts and tunnels are created by the shaft builders. You know, it's like, there's like <laughs> the entendres are kind of insane and I love it. And then, you know, yeah, there is like the creepy doctor character. So like, to me that was, and because that's early in the pilot, I was like, Oh no, is this the tone of the show? But mm-hmm. then I realized like, Oh, they know that this guy's a creep, but they have like no other choices. And so they're going to figure out ways to like get around this creeper. Um, so t- yeah, it it toes the line, but I think that's part of being campy. So so I think I think it does it well in in what I want from it. Um, there was something else I was going to say, and now I forgot. But I think of of the other kind of syndicated sci fi shows of this era, uh, not counting Hercules or Xena. Like you had mm-hmm. things like Mutant X, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Beastmaster, Andromeda, Lex, Earth, Final Conflict. Tech War, which was based on books William Shatner quote unquote wrote, and uh, like Relic Hunter. I, I've seen bits and pieces of all of these, and they all kind of take themselves a little too seriously. Mm-hmm. Like, this is the only one that really embraces the camp and tries to comment on itself and be a little meta here and there. And I really like it for that. I think it, like all these other shows that I mentioned, they can all just be kind of a slog and I will probably never watch them or go back to them. But 
the fact that this one embraces the idea of fun and camp, it's something that I could definitely watch and put on. Yeah. Oh, I remember what it was. So I was like, it kind of reminds me in that vein of like Barbarella, right? Where they're like Mm -hmm. playing with the tropes to like really put it in your face. And I think to me, that was kind of the vibe I was getting more so from um, this show, especially because like they're commanded by a female entity called The Voice. It's three women in charge. Oh, and then the other thing I wanted to talk to you about is, are they flying through the tunnels or just like falling and gracefully landing and with their weird spider-man-esque webs <laughs> that they sling <laughs> with, with, with their jizz shooters yeah, yeah. The weird things on their wrists <laughs> <laughs> but they're jizz shooters that's all they are yeah. um yeah i think they're flying and gracefully landing um through apparently this never-ending cavernous world that they've built yeah. underground somehow yeah so how do they get there, back there's up? a weird <laughs> mythology going on here what I'm like, how do you get back up? Is there, because like, even Cleo's like, where's the elevator? And I was like, I understand <laughs> the logic of how you fall and catch yourself and land. But like, obviously, there's many levels to this place. So is this like um, silo where you have to then climb all the stairs back up? Like, what's the situation? Yeah. And and who else is there? Like, I want to find out yeah. who else is living down there. Are there more? Like, How many survivors are there? Mm-hmm. Are you it? Is there you humanity in? or is it just like warrior sci-fi princesses? And why is there a cat man? Because they haven't really talked about the existence of aliens. There's just like this the you know, cyborg race. Yeah. So is this like a mutant cat? <laughs> Are these the pe- things that were living under the ground when we built like the tunnels, you know? Right. Exactly. I, yeah. The snake, the snake for me was such a, Ooh. it just like bobbled its weird little head and like giggled. Did it even have any lines? I can't even remember. I don't think so. It was very like a Super Mario Brothers, the movie, the original where the, you know, the, the Goombas, they kind of look like that. That's yeah. a big body, a little weird snake head. It's like, hmm. Um, Not a good yeah. design. So if you want to buy the complete the complete series, it's $160 on, oh my God. on Amazon. My God. That's insane. That is a lot. eBay, here we come. Yeah, that's going to be an eBay purchase. I um, Glorious SD, <laughs> $160. Yes, standard definition, baby. Um, it also kind of, I don't know if you've seen, there's this movie that I love, and it, it feels like it has similar like campy vibes called Space Truckers. Um, oh, it's, it's a, a Dennis Hopper Dennis Hopper, movie. Stephen yes. Dorff. Yeah, yes. yeah. I need it. I think space truckers might be a part of an essential sci-fi if you want to talk about it someday. Oh, I would love to talk about it someday because it has like half the cast of Game of Thrones in it. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> incredible. <laughs> I've, uh, I've never seen it. I know of it, but I've never seen it. I need to uh, watch it. It's amazing. Um, but yeah, it's like this to me was fun in the way that I like things like space truckers and the way that I like um, uh, spa- uh, troopers. Star, starship troopers right? starship troopers yeah you know like they're going to fight giant bugs it's like give me all of the absurdities with some like fun costumes and a little bit of space pew pews like mm-hmm. i'm ready <laughs> yeah and make it half an hour and that's fine and you know what yeah. if i watch the entire first season and i'm still super charmed by it i'll watch that second season that has hour long episodes so what see see how they manage to stretch it you know i it's it's kind of um there is a charm to their ability to be concise with plot for a half hour show. Cause I think about like one of the many reasons why like I like Star Trek lower decks is they managed to fit an insane amount of plot into 26 minutes an episode. Um, and so while this did not have the same amount of plot fit <laughs> into 26 minutes, it was a pretty simple but there's beauty in simplicity, a very simple pilot. Um, I was left with more questions than answers. So maybe it could have had a few more pieces of exposition available to us. Um, but then again, we all complain about big exposition dumps in pilot episodes. So maybe it's better to have these questions and be like, just keep watching the show. <laughs> yeah, it definitely dropped a few things where you're like, I kind of want to know more about that. Who's Who's that guy in her wood wallet? Yes. Uh, who exactly is the voice that tells them to do all this dangerous shit? And why are yeah. they following it? Who's this it's, woman they're listening to? Yeah. Oh, they're space Charlie's Angels. It's just Charlie's Angels, yes. but, in, but in sci-fi world, not space, yes. underground. <laughs> Listener, if you want to watch something that blends 
Xena, Terminator, Charlie's Angels, yeah. Pam Anderson's VIP, Beastmaster. This is it. This is it. This is for you. Yeah. This is it. Uh, it two profound thumbs up over here. Yeah, I would. I would recommend it. It's 26 minutes. It's worth the 26 minutes. Absolutely. To watch this. And if you enjoyed it, you know, keep going. Um, yeah, just Google Cleopatra 2525 Quest for Firepower. That's the first episode. You'll find it and you might find more episodes. And for a measly $160, a brand new DVD of the entire se- series on uh, Amazon. I wonder if, and like, uh, you know, check your local video establishment if um, mm-hmm. they still exist. I know like we have iHeart, uh, WeHeart video here in Austin. Oh, I wonder if WeHeart has this shit. That's what I'm wondering. I'm like, they they would be a place that has this. I know Los Angeles has um, Vidiots out in Eagle Rock, mm-hmm. which has like a pretty extensive collection. So I would, I would check those places because this feels like something they might have. All right. All right. Thank you for joining me. Um, anything else to say about this, this fun episode? I mean, I... I like it. Have fun. You know, we should uh, have more fun trash like this, I think, on television. It's a shame we've eliminated camp uh, in so many ways. So I I hope to see, I I have hope that it might be coming back. I've seen some glimmers of it in things like Dick's the Musical, which uh, I think is now available for rent and I'm excited to check out. So I'm here for some absurdity, some camp, some lighthearted fun. The world is trash. So let's have a a little levity here. (laughs) The world is trash. Let's have some more camp sci-fi trash in our lives, please. Even if we have to go all the way back to the year 2000 yeah. and watch old episodes of Cleopatra 2525 or go all the way back to the 90s, maybe, and watch Space Truckers. When, when did that come out? I think 99. Okay. Yeah, perfect. And with these inessential sci-fi episodes, I usually want to ask my guests to give me a recommendation, but you naturally did. So Space Truckers is going to happen. Yes, Space Truckers is is definitely up on that list for me. Um, I was trying to think. I did just, if you're a horror fan and you love a, a good Tubi classic, I did just watch um, Head Cheerleader, Dead Cheerleader. And if you're into slasher flicks and you want to watch someone's really bad reinterpretation of Scream that only mm-hmm. takes place in like three locations, highly recommend. It's also only an hour and 20 minutes long. <laughs> Tell me that's a Tubi original. It's not a Tubi original, but it is on Tubi. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of is. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mariah, where can people find you? Yeah, you can listen to me talk about Star Trek on Star Trek Discovery Pod. Um, those episodes, we do a live stream on Thursdays with the episodes releasing on the weekend after. Um, you can find that on Spotify, Apple Pod, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, and you can follow me at Mariah Gossett. That's Mariah with a Y and two R's and Gossett with two S's and two T's. Follow Intergalactic on threads and Insta at Intergalactic Pod. Visit intergalacticpod.co for links to everything and sub to the pod on Spotify, Apple Podcast. Also on YouTube, you can find me on Insta and on threads at Mike Moody Garcia. And if you have a recommendation for inessential sci fi, just send it our way uh, Instagram at Intergalactic Pod or threads at Intergalactic Pod. All right. Thanks, Mara. Bye bye. Thanks for listening.